Hi, my name is Jeff Perry. I'm an independent scholar, and I've spent um, much of my past 30 plus years researching the work of Hubert Harrison and Theodore W. Allen. They are two of the 20th century's most important thinkers on race and class. Uh, later today, we're in Atlanta. We're going to be delivering two talks on Harrison, one at Morehouse College and one at the Auburn Avenue Reference Library. But right now, I want to talk a little about, Hubert ha uh, about Theodore W. Allen. Allen is the author of The Invention of the White Race, two volumes, came out in 1994 and 1997 for Verso, and he also edited this piece back in 1974-75, Class Struggle and the Origin of Racial Slavery, The Invention of the White Race, which I um, have edited and, and written an introduction to. It is available online at my webpage, www.jeffreybperry.net, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Perry, P E R R Y dot net. In talking about Allen's work, I think it's good actually to go back to Harrison and to talk. Harrison, uh, this is a biography recently came out, Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism, 1883 to 1918. Harrison was born in St. Croix. And one of the points I make in the biography and relates directly to Allen's work is that the color line was drawn differently in St. Croix than in the United States, particularly in Virginia, the pattern setting southern colony. And the difference is the following. At its core, in St. Croix, there was a policy of promotion of a sector of the African descended population, whereas in the United States, there was a policy of severe racial proscription. Let me elaborate a little further. In St. Croix, which had between 20 and 30,000 people through much of the 19th century. If you have 100% of the population, 5% were European, 80% were black plantation laborers, and 15% were so-called free colored. The 5% uh, Europeans, essentially of the upper classes in St. Croix, upper and middle classes, in order to maintain control and work the plantations, the plantations were capitalist production efforts. And in order to, the, the capitalists in such a situation have two main tasks. One is they desire to make profit. Two, they have to maintain social control. In order to main social, maintain social control in St. Croix, the Europeans tried to utilize the 15% of free color because they could not control 95% of the population. So they did this, two principal instruments of their doing this, two principal uh, policies that they implemented. One was they created a militia, which was the major armed force on the island. And in St. Croix, the militia was composed primarily of free color. In contrast, in Virginia, in the colonial period, and during the period of slavery, the principal instrument of social control was the slave patrol which by definition was uh, lily white, it excluded all people of African descent. So that's a marked contrast. A second significant difference is that in 1834 in St. Croix, uh, the, the, uh, a law was passed, an edict, by the ruling class, the ones who make up the rules. And uh, it was an edict of full equality, granting full equality, at least nominally, in status between free coloreds and Europeans. In contrast, in the 19th century, the m most significant law affecting uh, this type of a situation was the Dred Scott decision in 1856 and 1857, which held that no black person had any rights that a white was bound to respect. So you have the contrast. In St. Croix, there's a policy of promotion. In the United States, the, uh, in the colonies, and in the states, after the United States is formed, you have the severe racial proscription. No blacks could rise too high in the South in the plantation economy. If they did, they suffered very likely the fate of being burned out, bombed out, to knock on the door at midnight, all the different types of terror uh, from Klan activities and other activities. Klan, of course, comes later, but of Klan type activities, vigilante type activities. Now, um, so that's the context. Now, how does it manifest itself when Hubert Harrison's going up in the late 19th century? Um, 
besides the policy of promotion versus prescription, St. Croix has no history of lynch terror and no formal segregation. In contrast, in the United States, in the South in particular, but all over the country, when Harrison comes to New York in 1900, lynching, segregation, and disfranchisement mar the land. So Hubert Harrison, who's an early 20th century Caribbean immigrant to the United States, comments, as does Marcus Garvey, who comes from Jamaica, as does Claude McKay, who comes from Jamaica, as does so many Caribbean immigrants. But McKay, uh, com they comment on this, but McKay frames it very well. He writes, I never encountered such a bitter racial hatred as I did when I came to the U.S. In the United States, the white supremacy was more virulent, more vicious, more organized than in St. Croix. It's a marked and a qualitative difference. I use that as an introduction to the work of Theodore W. Allen. And his work on the invention of the white race explains how the social control system developed in the southern United States. In his book on the invention of the white race, on the back cover, Allen opens with the provocative statement, but very accurate, that when the first Africans arrived in 1619, there were no white people in Virginia. Now, Allen bases this on 885 years of research in county records, going to the, the Accomack County, the different counties in Virginia, and each year is considered one county year. And he went through over 800 years of these records, and the word white does not appear until 1691, nor does the white race as we know it function until that time. Now, what Allen describes is a situation as follows, and his work is, re is reinforced by n a number of very important writers and scholars. Much of the history is corroborated by the work of Edmund Morgan, although at certain points Allen and Morgan differ, and I will talk about that. And also the very important work of Lerone Bennett, Jr., the senior editor of Ebony Magazine. Bennett's book that is very instructive on this is The Shaping of Black America. Morgan's book, which has much good detail in this period, is American Slavery, American Freedom. Now, what Allen describes is a situation in which after the, the uh, colony, after Jamestown is established, 1616 is a turn to tobacco growing. That becomes the cash crop in Virginia. And um, by 1622, there, there's, you know, there's some tension between the colonists and the Native Americans, the Powhatan Confederation, who are in the area. And in 1622, there's a confrontation in the Powhatan Confederation, Native Americans have the preponderance of power, so the colonists are left within roughly the confines of the fort, Jamestown Fort, and they can venture out a little bit, but they couldn't go too far. In that period, the ruling elite of the colony impose a new labor status on laboring people. The, the relation, since the turn to tobacco, they had capitalist relations of production functioning in Virginia. And for laboring people, two of the principal ones were actual laborers and tenants at halves, where they would work and you know, turn over half their product. Um, and now it's important also to understand that in England, where, where the majority of the colonists were coming from, there was an established labor law that had been fought out over three centuries and it was codified in 1563 in the Statute of Artifices, which basically maintained that there were such things as the rights of an Englishman. You couldn't be bought and sold, and some other things. Now, what happens in 1622, after the skirmish with the Native Americans, the people who had control over the supplies in the fort um, take advantage of that situation and the desperation of other people, and they impose a new labor status on tenants and laborers, not all, but on many of them. And it's called the custom of the country, and it, what it is is a limited term, part-time chattel bond servitude, where somebody had to work for somebody three to five years, and they could actually be bought and sold to somebody else, like, you know, like a piece of chattel. This was a total qualitative break from prevailing English labor law. And between 1622 and 1676, limited term chattel bond servitude, grows in importance in Virginia. There are also free laborers and other statuses. Um, and, but what's important to know is that in that period between 1622 and 1676, three quarters of the chattel bond servants in Virginia are European American. 
Um, one quarter, roughly, are African American. Um, in 1660, roughly, the price of tobacco takes a turn, on the, a turn downwards on the international market. Conditions really uh, worsen for, you know, at all levels in the colony. And um, as conditions get, get more difficult, and you have to understand, many people, conditions were hard anyway, and many laboring people were not f finishing their three to five years or their four to six years. But as conditions worsen, the people at the bottom of society resist in various forms. They run away, they fight. But in the period between 1660 and 1676, there are 10 laboring class and bond servant revolts in Virginia. Now what I should mention, and this is very important, and Allen does a very nice job on this, Morgan does a good job on it, and Lerone Bennett explains this very well. In the period between 1622 and 1676, the conditions for laboring class and bond servant European Americans and African Americans were very similar. And in, in that situation, the European Americans and the African Americans did what normal would, people would do in the, such situations and oppressive conditions. They fought together, they resisted together, they ran away together, they made love together. They do what normal people would do. Now, what happens then in 1676 is the big rebellion. It's called Bacon's Rebellion. And it starts out in its first stage as a, a conflict within the elite and sub-elite over the rate of expropriating land, of taking land from the Native Americans. But it quickly turns into a civil war in the people at the bottom of society, in which the people at the bottom of society start to rise up. They wind up in that struggle. They kick out the governor. They burn Jamestown, and the rebels control six-sevenths of Virginia land for nine months. That's how long it takes to bring forces from England to put down the rebellion. Um, in the final stages of that rebellion, in a, and it's documented in a very important and historic document, Grantham's account, but it's documented in other sources also. But in Grantham's account, he explains how in the final stages of that rebellion, he met 400 Negroes and Europeans in arms, and explains how they were. Many were there, for, wanted to cut him up and disembowel him, and you know they they were not. They were fighting. You know they wanted to fight till the end. They didn't want to hear anything, and they were demanding their freedom from bondage. Now you would not have a situation of such unity between Europeans and Africans for the next 300 years in the South. And notice what Grantham's account says. Negroes and Europeans. We still don't have the word white, right? We still don't have the white race functioning. Obviously, if there are not all white slave patrols, but if European Americans and African Americans are fighting together. What Allen then describes is how in the aftermath of Bacon's revolt, rebellion, the ruling class seeks to devise a means of social control, the same problem that was faced in St. Croix, but under different circumstances. In St. Croix, you had few European Americans in Virginia, you have the majority of the population is European American. So what Allen describes is a situation, particularly between 1676 and 1705, but it goes on because it develops over time, and uh, in which is in which he says the white race is created. This is what he calls the invention of the white race, much of it codified by 1705 in laws. And what happens? What he essentially argues is the following that the white race was created as a ruling class social control formation in response to labor unrest as manifested in the period of and most particularly in Bacon's Rebellion. He says more. He says the white race was created and maintained by the extension of racial privileges to European Americans. What were those racial privileges in the early period? If you finished your three years or your five years, you got a barrel of corn, you got a musket, you're able to testify in court, you're able to marry. All of these extended as racial priv privileges, not extended to African Americans, and in fact to African Americans the disabilities were extended, the length of bondage was extended, denied all these rights. But Allen argues more, besides the white race being created by the extension of the racial privileges, and this is a very important component of his argument, he argues very effectively from the record that the extension of those privileges was not in the interest not only of the African Americans, but of the laboring class European Americans. 
that the white supremacy and the racism is not in the interest of the laboring class Europeans. So that's the essence of Allen's argument on the invention of the white race. Now, in his other works, he extends it over much of U.S. history with many implications. I'm just going to hide a f highlight a few things. In one of his pieces, entitled The Colonel and the Meaning, he describes how in three major periods in U.S. history, where there were overtures, this is after this Bacon's Rebellion, where there were significant overtures of efforts for European Americans and African Americans to come together. Um, and the periods he cites are Reconstruction after the Civil War, Populism in the 1890s, and this, uh, the Depression era, 1930s, where as conditions got hard, there was overtures of unity and people fighting, you know, to some degree together. Um, and he says in each and every one of those periods, the way the efforts for unity were beat back was by turns to white supremacy, and he details this. Now, just for contemporary audiences, I will mention one, and this cites some sources that uh, become available. Actually, Alan dies in 2005, come out in a book right around that time. So Alan didn't make reference to these, but these are the same arguments. And it's a book by a person named Ira Katz Nelson, entitled When Affirmative Action Was White. And Katz Nelson argues in relation to the, to, to the 1930s, the Great Depression, and the New Deal, he argues very effectively with great documentation that each and every, each and every program and policy from the New Deal into the 1960s was uh, created in a white supremacist fashion. Um, and he gets very specific. Um, and he, he uses the examples of labor law, for instance. And he shows how the prevailing, the major labor laws of the country exclude two particular categories, domestic workers and agricultural workers, groups that are overwhelmingly black and Latin. He discusses how questions of relief available to people in broad uh, programs, rather than being run federally, like say welfare, rather than being run federally, they are left to local authorities. So particularly in the South, when it's left to, to the local authorities, we have great disparities and very difficult for black people to get any kind of equal treatment with those situations. Similarly, and a very important one, is he documents how programs like the GI Bill, which extends the possibilities of home ownership, um, under the GI Bill, you, you could purchase a home with no down payment and extremely low mortgage. Now, I myself live in New York area, and in New York, North Jersey, where I live, the figures that Katz Nelson cites are over 60,000 families receiving these um, GI Bill homeowner loans, only 113 African Americans. And this, in my area, and probably here in Atlanta, where we are right now, and in other parts of the country, I, I'm quite sure this is the case, that's how the white suburbs get built, right? Many of them, right? Those lily white suburbs. Now, overall, what I get from my work from both Allen and Harrison, because they both hit certain consistent themes, is this concept. The concept that white supremacy is the principal retardant to efforts at social change in this country, and if we want social change, that's an issue we have to take on. Now, I'm going to jump back to Harrison just for a second, and I want to read a very... A, quote which really appeals to me about Harrison because I think it's important for work that gets done by us today. And he writes this in 1911, but he writes, and there's two parts to this passage. First he writes, politically the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. A touchstone is a black stone rub against gold, you rub it against gold to test the purity of gold. It's an extraordinary choice of words and I think we can apply it widely. Any issue we look at, housing, unemployment, education, health care, life expectancy, let's put it to the test. Let's see how are black people faring in relation to this. And if, as you will find in every area I mentioned, there are great racial disparities, I think it's our duty to begin to address them very concretely and look at how we will do it. Every issue we look at in society. Alan goes on to say, to point out, that true democracy and equality for Negroes, he, I mean, this is, excuse me, Harrison in 1911, true democracy and equality for Negroes implies a revolution startling to think of, even to think of. And what I think he, his insights are there 
are that he foreshadows the civil rights, black liberation struggle of the 1960s. When that basic struggle for real, genuine, thoroughgoing equality served as a catalyst for so many progressive efforts at social change, the labor movement, the women's movement, the student movement, peoples of color movements, gay and lesbian movements, all these movements take sustenance and energy from that basic struggle which hit at the core of how they maintained control in this country, that white supremacy. Now, one other thing I'd like to take it to, and this is for those um, who are interested in thinking a little more deeply on this, um, this whole question of white identity, I'd like to offer some thoughts on that. And they are the following. If what Allen writes, and, and what Harrison gets at me at that different period, but what Allen writes is true. If the white race is a ruling class social control formation, if we look at the nature of the oppression to analyze this white race, if we move beyond skin color, because Alan's whole first volume talks about the nature of oppression in Ireland at different periods and how there was racial oppression in Ireland for a reason similar to the fact that we had the racial oppression here in the colony and how that situation is different than other parts of the world. If we understand racial oppression, um, by the nature of the oppression, we move beyond skin color and we understand the white race as a ruling class social control formation, then I myself see nothing at all progressive in any European American identifying as white. Um, I think for myself, and uh, I would encourage others, I think the task is to oppose white supremacy, to oppose white privileges, generally and in our own lives, um, for me, I consider my struggle to try and be as human as I can. I am not even handed about this. I understand it's very different for black men and women in that for them to be proud of the, you know, proud black man, proud black women, that poses a challenge to white supremacy. We need challenges to white supremacy. But for European Americans, identifying as white does not pose a challenge to white supremacy. I think we have to really examine more deeply and probe more deeply. And I think, I think the direction that in the society we'd like to build, I think it would take European Americans to move in the direction of being more human.